so the talk is based on my book, The Flexibility Paradox, Why Flexible Working Leads to Self-Exploitation and What We Can Do About It. Um, and I want to kind of start with us. And I, I felt like, and I, I say this in the book as well, like this book is a, an accumulation of, of probably more than a decade, maybe 15, 20 years of research that I've conducted around flexible working and kind of the outcomes of flexible working, as well as, you know, the determinants of it. And it really started possibly from my own reflection on my own life and working life. And I feel like a lot of the work that I talk about, a lot of the stuff I do talk about is quite related to a lot of academic life. Three, uh, four, uh, five years ago, Andrew and Donis, uh, who's a labor lord, um, a labor party, uh, like uh, 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 Lord, uh, Lord, is uh, put a, a really quite an interesting point here, which is actually to do with Oxford as well. So he talked about how, oh, it's so ridiculous that academics have three months off during the summer. And how that it's it's like no other occupation will have such a thing. And also talks about how like how he spent time in Oxford and he did like no not like most academics don't even teach. I don't know how it is in Oxford, but I'm pretty sure that wasn't the case. And actually, if you think about it, and those of you who are in this room will know, academics are notorious for having one of the worst working conditions. And in the kind of most recent Times Higher Education um, research has shown that very, a lot of people don't even take any holidays, like a week's or two weeks holiday at all, to the point where even during the holidays, and, and many of you, you know, will recognize this, that you take loads of academic articles with you and take a load, you know, your, your notebook computer with you because you're just going to do a little bit of this or that, or you take books, but then you take academic books to read with you, that we almost with the most, those of us with the most control over when and where we could work. And also in some ways, how much work we can do, although I'll talk about how, why that's actually not true. We end up exploiting ourselves to the max, which is actually what our most recent strike is about. And, you know, furthermore, I think, you know, increasingly we're working from home and many of us experienced this during the pandemic and before the pandemic, where that kind of flexibility and control over work results in us experiencing this le high level of, of boundary blurring, where rather than economic, you know, economic rational uh, choice, uh, rational choice uh, theories would argue that, you know, workers can expand their, their leisure time as much, as much as possible. But what you actually end up doing is workers end up working all the time and everywhere. So the crux of the para flexibility paradox or the definition, if you want, is that when workers gain work control and freedom over when and where they work, for example, the use of flexi time, working time autonomy, teller or homeworking, they end up working harder and longer. And I like to kind of use the word, uh, the quote from Anne Gruland in 2007 articles that the highly praised freedom of modern flexible work life may turn into a honey trap, tempting and straight, but a sticky trap where again, workers end up working all the time and everywhere. By the way, uh, I know that there has been a domino effect of people turning their videos off, but I would really appreciate it if at least, I mean, Gemma, thank you for having it on, but also for other people. But if you can put it on, because otherwise I can't see the response and then I don't, I don't like to talk to myself. I do actually, but I do it too often. <laughs> Anyways, so this is what the book is about. This is the content. And just to give you a very brief uh, uh, overview of it. So I introduce the idea, the concepts. And then it, the second chapter really looks at the demands and trends for flexible working. Is that how much flexible working is there? Has there been an increase or not? And what, what kind of legislative changes have we seen over the years across the world? I mean, not every single country, but as an example, like Korea, Australia, Italy, um, so forth. The dual nature of flexible working, which is about whether or not it is a friendly, family friendly arrangement or is it a performance enhancing arrangement is covered in chapter three. I do an overview of the outcomes of flexible work in chapter four. I'm not going to go into those chapters because kind of that's not the crux of the book. The main thing is about what is the flexibility paradox and why does it happen? So I'm going to first talk about the theories behind it. Um, 
And then I'm going to give you a very brief introduction of the empirical evidence. If you need more evidence of that, obviously you could look, read the book, but also as, as if you go to my webpage, I've already kind of published a lot of these papers uh, based on the ESRC uh, project, which is called the WAF project. WAF coincidentally in Dutch means is, is bark, like bark as a dog, bark, bark. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to go into today, I'm going to go into the gender flexibility paradox where Freedom over work leads to more work, but that the nature of work is different for men and women because of our gender normative views about what men and women should be doing. And then, it, and then a little brief idea about flexibility stigma, which is related to the gender flexibility paradox about how flexible working can lead to stigmatized views. And then the question is for whom? And what I really wanna focus on today, given that I'm giving a series of talks and I'm not saying everybody's gonna attend everything, but especially in relation to the fact that this is the Oxford Department of Social Policy and Intervention that I wanted to kind of focus on, on policies. And, and so I wanted to present a bit more and maybe focus a bit more on the policy context as well as the role of context in shaping the kind of flexibility paradox or whether the question is can shaping or changing context change the flexibility paradox outcomes and then kind of go into conclusions and maybe you know if we have time talk a little bit about what I kind of what I think some of the take-home messages or, or kind of what you know are you know what our typical end of article what future researchers should do kind of a section for those of you especially if you know if those of you may be interested in this topic and are looking for new ideas so that's kind of what I that's it. Um, just to give you a flavor, again, you know, flexible working in, in this kind of presentation in the book really talks about the control over when and where you work. And just to give you an idea of how much flexibility there was kind of across Europe, uh, you know, using the European Working Conditions Survey. I'm not going to go into that too much. I'm going to go straight into why is it that when workers have control over when and where they work, do they work longer? So I drew a lot from kind of existing literature and I'm not the first one, a first person to show it. There has been lots of other colleagues who, who have been doing this. One of which is Claire, Claire Kellier from Cranfield Business School and DJ Anderson, who's also in the same uh, school at the moment. They studied um, UK organizations and focused mostly on part-time work and, and teleworking. And they said that workers ended up intensifying their work, both in terms of, uh, of time, but also so working harder. And they posed three theoretical perspectives, the imposed intensification, social exchange theory, and enabled intensification. Just to briefly kind of tell you what these are. The first one is that employers may, the first one imposed intensification is that employers may actually impose additional work through the back door. Um, the example they give is about a part-time worker who have gone to part-time work, but actually is doing the full-time load which you know, a lot of feminist literature has been talking about since, I don't know, since part-time work ever existed. <laughs> um, and I guess the other thing is where in terms, in relation to teleworking or, or flexi time is where the boundaries between work and private time is blurred where, you know, back in the olden days, if you were to have a nine to five kind of more regulated working condition, you would then any additional work that needed to be done after five o'clock, six o'clock would have been regulated by labor laws in terms of maximum working hours, but also overtime premiums, for example. So it would have been in a way protected either through additional income or labor laws that prohibit any work from being done, such as the working time directive, through the working time directive. But with flexible working, those kind of boundaries are shifted and blurred where workers could addition, you know, add kind of additional projects and workload. If you want more examples of this, just take a look at academic, what, what's had happened to, uh, in academia in the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years where you know, academics don't have working hours in their contract and we just keep being, you know, constantly being asked to do more and more. The social exchange theory is slightly different where workers and employers have an exchange where, oh, you give me the gift of flexibility, I will reciprocate through the gift of working harder and longer. It's essentially like, oh, you gave me this gift, so I don't want you to take it away, so I'm going to like reciprocate. I'll just work harder and show you how amazing of a job that I'll do. Um, but, but Bathini and Kandathil looked at an Indian IT company where 
they were saying it's a bit of a mix of both of them imposed and social exchange where employers give the workers access to flexible working with an explicit assumption that you will work more so that they actually increased project you know workload for the workers but in exchange that okay then you could do it from home if you wanted to so these kind of concepts blur and overlap a lot. The final one, which is interesting, is the enabling specification. So what Claire and, and Deidre talks about really is about how when you work from home, you get fewer distractions because you know that you don't get work distractions. Colleague come, you know, knocking on your doors, asking for coffee or something like that. So you work uh, better. But also that if you work part time, you're less fatigued, so you work harder. But also it's just that flexibility and then being able to kind of work at your the time and place you can do your work best. You reduce absenteeism and sickness. So that's kind of the enabled intensification. Masmanian and Putnam kind of take this a bit further and they talk about the autonomy control paradox. It's essentially looking at professionals in the US and the kind of the intersection with flexible working and digital technology. So in this Masmanian's case, this is about crackberries. I don't know if there are people, people here are old enough to remember what crackberries are, but it's the phones before the phones became smartphones, like blackberries where, you know, um, it was it was supposed to be very very addictive. Little did we know, phones will be even more addictive now. Um, but essentially, what they were saying is that people were given more freedom to work whenever, wherever. Especially with the the rise of digital technology, where the office your office is literally in the palm of your hands, and you could carry it around anywhere. But it was also imposed with a cultural norm of the profession and the organization, where it was expected that you will be you know, available all the time and everywhere. So that the freedom wasn't just free, that there was a lot of control mechanism, one of which was that there was an, a normative change in the profession, in the organization, that people will be tethered and always available. And in fact, people enjoy doing that because it enabled them to perform the ideal worker image, which is like the worker, you know, doesn't have any other responsibilities outside of work, always available, always on, that people enjoyed performing that, oh, you know, shooting off emails at 2 a.m. in the morning, shooting off emails at, and, you know, in the weekend. And they actually kind of resulted, the workers themselves kind of pushed themselves collectively to this downward spiral of performative always on culture. And that's kind of where that self-exploitation comes in, that it's not necessarily that employers are imposing this, you know, explicitly, that workers, when given this freedom and control over their work, that they're using it rather to enhance their competitive edge and market chances. The German sociologists haven't also been dis debating this for a very long time, interestingly, because, you know, you would expect Germany, you know, you wouldn't expect Germany to be these kind of countries because you would expect US, yes, UK to be these countries, but not Germany. But Pongress and Voss, for example, talks about Arbeitskraft Unternehmer and do not correct my German Bernard, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm joking. Um, entrepreneurie, which essentially is that it's not an employee anymore. It's an entrepreneurial worker where not only professionals, but they observed a pattern where managers were increasingly putting the onus of the realization of labor potential into performance to the worker. And that was given, again, you know, like using Gronod's uh, really nice point of the honey trap of here, you, you, you take, you know, you do your self-management of your performance, and here's a lot of flexibility that you will use to do it, but effectively turned into a much more efficient way compared to, let's say, our old ways, such as Taylorism, to get more out of, to squeeze more out of workers. And why does this happen is the question. And this is something that I'm trying to contribute to uh, through the book. Because as I said, the flexibility paradox as a phenomenon, the observation of that isn't real. But I think what, need, what was needed is to try to understand the larger sociological context in which it is happening. And the context is that we are currently experiencing the demise of collective bargaining, that no longer are workers 
protected under this collective bargaining, stronger unions, stronger collective bargaining power. So there's the individualization of workers. At the same time, our welfare states have been dismantled significantly to the point there are no job guarantees or income protection and no sense of the words in comparison to post-war welfare states where like, for example, with the beverage origin report. I mean, reading Bev the beverage report now sounds so radical that even the labor party cannot put this forward. This is just impossible. It's like the amount of protection that was guaranteed back to those days is, 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 is very different from now. And of course, with that rise of again, individualization and insecurity. And one of the key things is that we are now in a, in a society where we individualize, we assume, every individual assumes that they have the individualized risk. So you are, the workers are considered the masters of their own destinies. And this is kind of manifested through workfare. Wealth, and you could see this in the, you know, welfare attitudes on an unemployment, for example, in the US, uh, US and the UK, where, you know, benefit recipients are called scroungers. They could find a job if they wanted to. They shouldn't be relying on the state, for example. And that it contributes to the idea that individuals themselves are the ones responsible for enterprising oneself. So the freedom over one's work can only be used to enterprise themselves or you know, um, to make themselves more competitive and marketable. And it kind of draws and, and it touches upon, you know, I, I draw upon like Foucault's Homo, Homo Economicus where Foucault talks about how with the rise of neoliberalism, but also the idea of human capital, uh, which is, you know, a, a concept by Becker, that enterprising oneself is now the social fabric of individual need to make individual life itself as its relation to everything in society is now based on market values and is the uh, idea of economic efficiencies and um, how we kind of marketize these relationships. So effectively under these circumstances, what we are seeing is that perhaps more, you know, uh, certain occupations more than others, but across the occupations, we see that managers no longer need to control workers as we did in Taylorism times, but that social norms and context always do it for them. So to, and do it much more efficiently than you would have ever done if you were to have done it through managers because of these ideas of internalized capitalism. And I wanted to kind of put this out there, especially given that, you know, most of us are academics. And I'm, I just want you to identify some of the things that have been written here, which is just like a little uh, uh, meme, which is not in the book, unfortunately, because I didn't know how it could work. But you yourself will, you know, listening to this, you will, looking at this, you will identify this in yourselves. That productivity is considered more, you know, that you have to push yourself to the edge. You have to, you, your self-worth is largely ba based on your career. Um, Gersuni talks about business, busyness as a badge of honor, that busyness of, of work is now considered a badge of honor that you, when someone asks you, how are you doing? Oh, I'm busy at work. Because otherwise you are perceived as someone who is not contributing to the social value, to society. But also, and a lot of psychologists did this exam, and I, I give examples in the book, where you yourself, if you don't persuade yourself that you're busy at work, your self-worth, you, you don't consider, you know, your, 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 uh, your identity crumbles. So this, in this context, flexible working can only lead to, as I said, self-exploitation. Oops. Oh, I did this again. I, I, I went to the very end of the <laughs> presentation because I got too excited. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. And one of the, again, is it manifestation or is it the, um, is, is, is it a context? But another thing that you see a lot these days, and Aaron Check wrote a, a, a nice book on that. I've, I've, I've still yet to read it, but it's about passion, about the idea of passion exploitation. So we are now also expected that work should be our passion, that work should be something that's really important in us, but also it's like, it should be interesting. It should define you as a person and your self-worth is value to it. And 
you 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 kind of you know people think this is a very professional oriented kind of mindset, but it's not. It's, it's across all occupations. And uh, an interesting, ooh, do I have time to say that? I don't know. I, 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 if I go into an anecdotes, we, we would be here all day, but um, just a very quick one. Um, there was a BBC4 radio of a hospitality, a restaurant kind of manager, and they were talking about how like, she was having a really hard time finding workers, you know, due to probably Brexit. Um, but she was saying how like, but you know, it's not the working conditions, you know, this is really about, you know, pursuing your passion. We were talking about waitressing and, you know, waiters, and they're trying to undermine the working conditions of these groups of workers by saying that you get to work on a passion of yours, so you don't really need to be compensated for that. And that kind of rhetoric is being used every day. And this, again, academics, let's put a mirror, in, you know, in front of us and recognize how much of this is happening, how through the language of passion, we are enabling us to be exploited. Because again, a lot of psychological studies that I cite in this book, where when people consider someone is doing their passion job, not only do people think they, you know, uh, that, you know, you would exploit yourself, but also people think you should, you can be exploited. So essentially why we don't pay musicians a lot of money because you're doing something that you love, why should you get money for it? But the problem is it's not just musicians, it's everybody now. So this is where I kind of whiz by the empirical analysis. And I just trust that you, you trust me when I say it, it, it is uh, shown empirically, we did it cross-sectionally, we did it longitudinally, we did it, you know, panel data, we, we did all sorts of, we threw all sorts of fancy uh, quantitative methodological and also qualitatively as well. Um, we, we, we used all methods available, not just me, but me and you know, a lot of colleagues who are working on this to show that flexible schedules leads to overtime, you know, in, the, in Germany, in the UK, teleworking, homeworking leads to overtime. Um, for interestingly, for um, a lot of what you know, uh, so for, more, for more manual workers, what you find is that it, it also leads because a lot of people are like, oh, but this is isn't it more professional? It's like, no, actually, what you find is manual workers also increase their overtime, but not necessarily by working longer hours because they're usually paid per hour. That, but they they just take less breaks. As they just just keep working. They work harder during the time, but also they take less breaks. Uh, flexible working leads to more multitasking, but also it's not just about hours work. And I think Rosello and I were talking about this just before everybody came into the room, that it also is about the mental spillover, that you're just constantly thinking about work, worrying about work, and just that it not only takes your physical time and space, but it takes your mental, psychological, possibly emotional space, which is again, you know, um, not great. So this is an example of that. One of the things you find in this data, in these analysis, and again, repeated across different countries and across different data sets, is that on average, men increases their overtime hours, for example, um, uh, their hours more than women. So for example, using the German social economic panel, we found that using, you know, if you move from fixed schedules to working time autonomy, so autonomous hours, men increase their overtimes by two hours, whereas women only increased it by one hour. Now the question is then, okay, do women not exploit themselves so much in the labor, uh, if, if so much compared to men, right? And this is when we say, and we have to borrow from the kind of the, the past generation feminists, well, that it is a, it is essentially due to the inadequacy of the androcentric definitions of labor. It's because you're just looking at the wrong labor, and this has been something that, you know, has been said for how many years? Probably will be going into a hundred uh, anniversary soon. So this is where we talk about the gendered paradox. When Foucault talks about the enterprising of individuals, he doesn't talk necessarily only about enterprising oneself, that it's enterprising the family and the family relationship. In his book, he, oh, this is actually a series of lectures. It's not his book. He, he had series of lectures. Someone transcribed it and made it into a book. And it's, that's kind of an amazing thought to have. Um, God, I, I keep doing this. Back in the days, 
people like Foucault used to just rock up to lecture theaters and had a rant about an hour, and then people wrote it down on paper, and then there's a book, and, and that was his book. And it's, it's, I, I find that a great idea, an amazing kind of, it's, it's so different from what we see in academia now. But anyways, um, <clears throat> so he talks about how the mother-child relationship concretely characterized by the time spent he died with the child, the quality of the care, the affection. Essentially what he's saying is that all of that is also, you know, development of human capital in current day society. It's not just affection. That with the rise of this entrepreneurial self, what you find is that these activities are the investment in the child's human capital, which will result in income for fu the future for the family. So essentially, that mother's investment in children and the household is also a part of that kind of self-exploitation pattern of the subjectification of self, if you want. And this is what we have seen in the past decades through this idea of intensive parenting. Walls, intensive parenting is the idea that, and this is came from like brain development research as well, that how, you know, children should not be left alone. Back in the days, children were left alone, mothers kind of did whatever, and then, you know, whatever. But in the night, you know, from the 1990s onwards, it was the idea that, you know, parents, especially mothers, given our gender normative views about whose role it is to care, that mothers need to take, you know, ensure that you put the right amount of enrichment activities, engaging activities. Otherwise, you are damage, damaging your child's future, right? And this is, you know, it, it comes from optimal brain enrichment, but there's a whole range of things. And the whole culture of parenting has drastically changed to the point where, and this is drawing from Dottisani and Treas and others' work, where now full-time working mothers spend more time, almost double, if not triple more time than 1960s housewives with their children, right? What does that then relate to, how does that relate to flexible working? Flexible working, and I'm gonna repeat this later on, is just, um, it's, 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 it's a really good experiment of a reflection of society because essentially you're giving people freedom to do what they want to do. And what they use, what, how they use that freedom is a really good reflection of what our society looks like, right? And because our society is one where intensive parenting is a culture, is, is enforced, and there's a traditional gender norm, what happens is you actually get a traditionalization of gender roles through flexible working. Women do more housework and do more childcare when working from home and working flexibly, whereas fathers do not. Fathers increase their overtime hours. Why? Because fathers are still considered the breadwinners of the household. They're still considered the ones that are bearing the brunt of the financial responsibilities, whereas women are still considered responsible for housework and childcare and the well being of the family. So this is a whole bunch of empirical you know, analysis results for that. And one thing that I really like to say, which is a really nice one to say, for example, again, during the, using the German Social Economic Panel, you know, uh, fathers working from home increased their overtime about three hours, mothers uh, increased childcare by three hours. And this is where um, Sullivan and Lewis and others talk about the exploitation model. Um, Jane Lewis talked about this when, you know, she was talking about in the social politics article in 2008 about when talking about the right, the, the introduction of right to flexible work in 2003 by the labor government, that it was a way to free up female capital for free. Why? Because if you really want to free up female capital from the household, you need to really invest a lot in child care and parental relief, both maternity and paternity leave. You have to be able to free it up or companies have to drastically change the way they organize workers so that you, you allow workers to work, you know, again, you know, shorter hours, et cetera. Now, if you don't want to do that, what you do is you let people work flexibly. So you do, government don't need to change anything and companies don't need to change anything. And in fact, flexible working enables mothers or those, those with care responsibility to maintain their labor market positions during times of high demand, high, high care demands. But there is only 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a week. It's like that time. So if they're spending this much time on childcare and they're not in, in, you know, reducing their working hours, something needs to give. And what gives is that it's personal leisure time. 
And this is again found by not only Hilbrecht and all, uh, it's by Sullivan and Lewis through qualitative work, but Anna Kuroska uh, has also shown that what happens when mothers work from is that it crowds out, like it, it increases necessary work so that within the given time that you just kind of increase the necessary work crowding out personal uh, and leisure time. And this is why, you know, Sullivan Lewis and, you know, you, you talk, you know, and others talk about how it, it perpetuates the exploitation of women, because essentially without changing the normative views about work, without changing the normative views about gender, we are able to actually draw out more female labor market potential for free, just by introducing this policy. But what is more, it becomes even more problematic once we think about the flexibility stigma. The flexibility stigma is that when fle workers work flexibly for care purposes, that they are seen, they are stigmatized essentially. They're stigmatized because they deviate away from, again, I, I, I go back to this ideal worker image, that the ideal worker is someone who's always available, always, you know, on, you know, always, you know, hey, can you do, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, can you, yeah, of course, anytime, just whew, give it to me, I'll do it. Fast email responses, that kind of worker. The idea is that, you know, the because there is still like, you know, people are, you know, and even the, oh, we can't do that because it's recorded. The prime minister himself talks about, oh, like workers need to go back to work, like as if working from home, like working from home in quotation mark. There's this whole belief that people working flexibly are not working. People working from home are not working. And it is perpetuated by so many of these, if you want, leaders in the economy, such as you know, people like Goldman Sachs CEO, Apple CEO, Tim Cook said it. I could go on and on and, and tell you about. And there's like, if you go on like BBC or you know, Guardian, like there's always this, this article about city boss notes that you know people who are motivated will come back into the office, et cetera. But essentially there is this belief that flexible workers, especially for care purposes, are not committed, motivated, and productive and make more work for others. And this is some evidence of that. About a third of the population in the UK believe that to be the case. So that flexible workers are a hindrance to the rest of the, uh, uh, the, the organization but also the fear that it leads to negative career outcomes. The, there's an idea that it will be men who be more, much more fearful about the stigma because it not only makes them deviate away from the ideal worker image, but it also makes them deviate away from the um, masculinity because you know, as the breadwinner, you shouldn't be doing care. You should be just you know, providing for the family. But actually my thesis, and you know, I've, I've shown, and there's some evidence of this here, <clears throat> that actually who is going to be stigmatized when they work from home and it's not going to be the white heterosexual man able-bodied man let's just say it's that it's going to be those who are suffering from biases against their work productivity that will be suffering from their that flexibility stigma it could be mothers ethnic minority workers working class low skilled disabled lgbtq um, and again, there's some you know, evidence for that in these studies. So what you're saying, what we're saying is that women are likely to face career penalties when working flexibly, despite again, you know, our evidence shows that women and mothers actually do, maybe not as much as fathers, but they still increase their work intensity an hour uh, when working flexibly. But they also are less likely to even get access to flexible working, well, in pre-pandemic times at least, because employers fear that they're not gonna use that flexible working for performance enhancing purposes. On the other hand, you know, when, you know, which not part-time work, and I wanna really make it clear, a lot of the flexibility stigma and men not being able to work flexibly is about part-time work. And I, there is evidence to that, yes. But when we talk about, arrangements that give workers more control over when and where they work, it is women that were less likely to get access to those arrangements. And even when they do get those arrangements, they're much more likely to be penalized. But, and here's a big but, it's not always going to be the same. That a lot of the literature and a lot of the results that we, we draw from are coming from what we consider neoliberalistic countries and or very traditional valued countries. 
So again, flexible working is a mere amplifier of our current societal norms and structures. The way we think about work, work-life balance, gender norms shape the outcomes of flexible working. Essentially, again, one of the things I want to highlight, again, I looked at flexible working, especially about the control worker, the freedom workers have at work, because it's a really good way of seeing a reflection of all the problems in our society. Because if you let workers do whatever you want and see what they do, they're like, oh God, you would expect like, oh, they'll be really, you know, using it for their own benefits. And we're, we're seeing that that's not the case. But then those are impacted by, again, work cultures. The, the ideal work culture, long hours work culture, obviously are the ones that are driving this phenomenon. But we know that that's not the same across different countries. There are countries where there's a much better kind of notions of work-life balance, where work it doesn't and shouldn't, is not considered to be taking up all the time in your world. You know, like, you know, I know that the Netherlands may not necessarily be like the most ideal type, but you know, that the Dutch are a part-time nation. And I remember that in, you know, when I was doing my PhD there and postdoc that it was four o'clock people went home because, you know, you needed to go home, have dinner with her kids and their kids at quite early uh, in the day, but also you needed to do your sports. And these were things were really important. You know, taking your caravan to France and Germany was really important things that they needed to do, right? And of course, those kind of ideals shape the way freedom is used. And the other thing is, you know, really talking about, you know, homo economicus, one of the things I did talk about, and I want to do a bit more on is about welfare state institutions. It's about how a lot of these kind of patterns are manifested due to the fact that a lot of the welfare institutions are individualizing labor market risks by the dismantlement of unemployment benefits, the dismantlement of public employment services, dismantlement of AMMP, et cetera. So maybe welfare state institutions are also a, a major factor in how the way, the, you know, influencing the way workers use the freedom over their work. So, and this is something I haven't done, but you know, I would like to do it, or if someone's listening and they wanna do it, go ahead. <laughs> Another thing is about gender norms, about this whole gender flexibility stigma, or not the flexibility stigma, but also gender uh, flex flexibility paradox is that, you know, the notions of whose responsibility it is to care it matters. So obviously egalitarian societies won't have the same kind of outcomes. And actually Anna Kuroska's paper shows that, that in, I wanna say Sweden, oh God, I, I keep forgetting if it was Sweden or Denmark. So she compares Poland with Sweden and she finds that the, the patterns are very, very different. Um, family policies matter because, you know, and again, you know, we, we know this because we talk about how shared parental leave really shapes how, you know, the kind of the gender roles and, and gender norms, but also childcare policies and national level policies really pursuing and giving out that message that yes, we need better work-life balance, that better work-life balance is a norm rather than a right, uh, but the right rather than a gift, sorry makes a difference in, in, in how flexible working is used. And, and then again, last thing is about workers' bargaining coverage, but uh, bargaining positions may be through union power, collective bargaining power, or unemployment rates. The power of workers and the protection that they can be guaranteed, again, collectively matters. And I mean, the results are like these, you know, yes, all of these factors shape how flexibility, uh, flexible working is used. So, you know, countries with, you know, say strong unions, generous family policies, less work central norms and, and, and more progressive gender norms are the ones that flexible working is more wise, widely spread. <clears throat> it also shapes the way flexible working is stigmatized. And also another thing is the, the, the wider spread flexible working is, is less likely that it is stigmatized for various reasons. Um, but it also shapes the outcomes of flex work. And especially in regards to outcomes, it influences a, a more, oops. Oh, I did that again, sorry. <laughs> that of women than of men. And this is just some examples of how, you know, the expansion of flexible working, which is on the X axis, reduces kind of perception of like flexibility stigma. And this is using kind of European data there. And this is just the outcome to show that flexi time increases work family conflict perceptions, but not in countries where childcare policies are very generous. This is a work in progress a paper that 
I still need to submit. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about very briefly was about COVID, but I don't think I have time for it. But if anybody wants to talk about how COVID changed things. We still have uh, a few minutes. Yeah, so, but I still have a conclusion. Okay, okay, I'll just say this. So COVID changed things, why? Because all of a sudden, flexible working isn't something that workers asked employers to give them, right? It's just like, it was a government enforced. It was either like you let workers work from home or you, there's no work to be done, right? Unless you're essential workers. So what that meant is that people were working from home without that kind of stigmatized view. And this is just a bit of a, an indication of how that kind of flexibility stigma reduced quite significantly over the pandemic. And this is just one, as I said, because the Charter Institute for Personnel Development, the Charter Management Institute, like there's a lot of studies that do this and it's the same thing. But then the question is, how about other patterns of flexible flexibility paradox? Like, did we see other patterns uh, of the paradox occurring? And the question, uh, the answer is yes. Actually, even during the pandemic, home workers, <clears throat> flexible working resulted in longer hours during the pandemic. So people worked longer hours, so total increase of hours there. So essentially people started er work early and uh, later uh, across countries. And also in terms of, I don't know what to show you, but um, <clears throat> division of housework and childcare, we did see that fathers, given that there wasn't, you know, flexible working was much more of a norm, that fathers were able to use homeworking as a way to be more involved in housework and childcare. And this is something that's been said a lot of times, so it's not new. But what maybe hasn't been saying more is that mothers working from home have increased it even more, right? So it actually didn't equalize division of housework. That the traditionalization of kind of gender roles through house uh, homeworking still existed. It's just that fathers did more, but mothers did even more, so to say. The final bit I want to say is where do we go from here? Um, there are some kind of future scenarios I talk about, which is in the slides at the end of uh, this, which I'm not, not going to go into, but if anybody is interested, I could share the slides and you could take a look at it. What do we need to do? especially at the national level, because, you know, we are all, in, you know, scholars interested in national policies. What does the government need to do to help that the paradox is not necessarily eliminated, but weakened, right? First thing is that I want to emphasize again, I, I've been spending like 45 minutes bashing flexible working. Do I do not want flexible working to be, to be spread? No, absolutely not. I want, I'm a big proponent of flexible working. I feel like, you know, we should have stronger rights for flexible working because again, one of the key areas that we talk about is about the stigma and the gifts exchange, et cetera, that we need protection. So we need stronger rights to flexible working, such as the Finnish did, where workers have rights to kind of uh, to define 50% of their time in terms of when and where they work, but also protection about discrimination against uh, flexibility stigma. So that you are protected even when you work flexibly uh, by law. Another thing is about right to disconnect. And a lot of companies, including Ireland, including the Portugal, the Portuguese government, uh, the French government, and like they've been talking a lot about this because it's not necessarily about, on one hand, this is a this is a necessary step for us to protect workers, especially given that our labor laws are based on like industrialized times, right? Like industrialization times. Like we are like, this, the labor laws are so old, it's not applicable anymore. So we need new laws to do what the old labor laws did. And one of the things that are necessary is right to disconnect, make sure that workers can be protected from being tethered to the office. But it also, I think helps enable or enable a culture to be developed so that you don't go into that downward spiral of everybody being available all the time and everywhere. And that essentially what we need is a stronger right to protect private time. And I think our current labor laws are not adequate for that kind of thing. And I know that ILO has been trying to change this in terms of changing their um, ILO directives, but we're still not quite there yet. So the right to disconnect is a very nice interim step, if you want. <clears throat> we have to have 
earmarked well paired paternity leave. I think uh, there's like a, like, I think about 30% of, of social policy scholars are, are shouting this <laughs> on a regular basis. So I don't, I, I wanna join that chorus to say, we need more fathers at home, early days earmarked without mothers, well paid because that's the only way we could solve this whole gender normative views about whose role it is to care. I think we also need to think about work. We are currently in a society where, think about this. So back in the 1960s, work, working hours, I mean, it depends, like Germany is, is, a, is a case where the working hours have been reduced, but in the US and the UK, for example, working hours have not really reduced at that significant level as we have seen over the, uh, the previous decades. So especially from the eighties, it's been, we talk, Kozer talk about the greedy institutions that you're asking more and more of workers. You are actually seeing an increase of work, working hours, especially of full-time workers. And at the same time, you're asking more of parents. So parents, even the UK time news survey from 2001 to 2015, you see that the increase of full-time workers, moms, uh, not only increased their working hours, they've increased their, their childcare hours. Like what is happening, moms? They're not sleeping or what is that, you know? I could tell you what's happening, I'm one of them. Anyways, um, so we have to have a way to make a meaningful kind of a national intervention of trying to do something where we, we have to change our assumption that there's gonna be one breadwinner and one care, that there are two people working in the household where there's a lot of other things that need to be done in the house. So shorter working week or four day week can maybe be uh, an approach. Um, and I guess some other things I wanted to talk about is like we talk about shorter work and disruption of work culture. I think one of the things I want to talk kind of end with was about with social policy scholars about like how limited just focusing on policy change in the very short uh, narrow area of social policy uh, can be. So essentially what I'm trying to say is so this is kind of based on an, an article that will be published in the Journal of Social Policy soon is that we might need to dip into other areas of policies, including labor laws or labor policy or, you know, working time laws, like to really be able to disrupt and make kind of meaningful changes that we want to make in terms of social justice, social, you know, um, in terms of gender equality, et cetera. Um, and the other thing to say is kind of to look at kind of maybe the interactions of these policies, such as unemployment benefits and job security, and unions of collective bargaining on the impact of family policies, which is something that I've just mentioned. So I'm not going to talk about it because I know I'm running out of time. And there's a couple of uh, slides I have about what HR managers should do and what individuals should do, but I don't want to do it. But just final slide is that flexible working is not a panacea. It amplifies the problems of our work and gender cultures. It actually has a potential to solve many of the problems and create equal opportunities for workers who are unable to take part in the labor market. So it is like, actually can be a really fantastic policy, but it can also amplify problems. Thus, without serious reflection and dismantlement of our work, work, life balance, gender cultures, we are gonna see a lot of unintended negative outcomes and possibly more for certain groups of the labor market. Okay, so that is the discount code. I would put it on the, the um, the, uh, the chats again, but thank you very much.